Good evening. Why don't you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 15. Read a verse from there in just a few minutes. Romans 15. Good to be with you again. Thanks for having me. It's hard to believe it's been a year, but a lot of connections here for me at this current They're doing good and enjoying this series of lessons. I think they look like good ones. Um, I'm tasked tonight, though, with not a good one. You know? Um, This is a picture. We went to Dollywood a few weeks ago, and there's an old schoolhouse kind of set up in there. You can go look inside. And, you know, it was neat to see. Anna does a lot of homeschooling. And, you know, neat to see the old schoolhouse and some of the stuff they had up there. But, you know, I've never been in someone's home and seen a picture like this up on the wall. Have you ever seen that? I, I don't... I don't think I've ever seen someone... Well, we tend to put pictures up of things we enjoy. You know, pictures of your beach trip, pictures of your family, pictures maybe of where you grew up or your football team or something like that. I've never once seen anybody say, look, these are the happiest times of my life to be at school. No, when you're a kid, what do you think? It's miserable. I mean, you count down the days till school's out and you're done. I mean, no, look, I went through school. I graduated high school. I didn't enjoy a, a day of it. And then when you're done, you're like, well, we'll you know, go to college maybe and finish that up. And what's the last thing you say when you get done with school? Oh, I'm so glad. I'm never going to do that again. And then here you come to church, and every week somebody's trying to yell at you about something. And it's probably not the most enjoyable thing. Now, look, the series of lessons has been... I don't know, like he said, uplifting, encouraging, bearing one another's burdens. Like, I'd sign up for that. Loving each other. Like, yeah, we should do that as a church. But when you come to tonight's lesson, and I I still don't know how I ended up with it, admonishing one another, that's, that's kind of a tough one to swallow. People don't like that concept. They don't like that idea. They really don't want that in their life or in the church. I remember somebody years ago, I've been preaching for about 20 years. I remember early on, somebody left the church that I was preaching at. And I remember they made a post online and they said something like, hey, glad to be at a place now where I'm not going to be judged. Well, I mean, what does that say? What does it say about me? What does it say about them? Well, what does God want us to understand about the concept of admonishment. And we'll try to define that Bible word tonight. And what should we think about it in relation to each other? Because I doubt on the surface, many of us think, you know what? It's raining outside. It's dark. I'm going to get in the car and drive down there and get yelled at. Like That's what I'm looking forward to. But the reality is, there's a place for that in God's family. And the more true reality is, we probably need it more than we expect. And if we're really honest, we probably don't do a good job of this as a church family. We can let a lot of things go. So tonight, I'm excited to be able to talk to you about this concept of admonition, what that means for us. And we'll look at some examples in the Bible of the idea of what I think admonition should be. And then we'll talk a little bit about what it means to to be on the receiving end of that, because for most of the lesson, we're going to think about the one dishing it out. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the spirit in which we do this kind of stuff, because I think the Bible shares some notes about that for us too. So glad to be with you tonight, and hoping that it's helpful with you as we kind of jump in. Look, let's do this first. Let's define the term we're talking about. I ask you to turn to Romans chapter 15 and... And in this text, um, I don't want to just rip it out of context here, but you know, obviously chapters 14 and 15 have been talking about church disagreements and difficulties in working with brethren and the strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And, and you know, Paul, going to close with some remarks here, says, I myself am convinced about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, having been filled with all knowledge and being very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again, 
because of the grace that was given to me by God for me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. And he would go on to explain why he's writing to them. But, you know, he says here, almost parenthetically, look, I know you guys can handle a lot of things. So bear with me a little bit as I'm kind of writing to you. But notice what he says they're able to do. You yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. So in a sense, he's saying, you don't really need me. I think you're pretty good and able to do the things you need to do as a church, but allow me some space to do what I need to do anyway. But what can we learn from this? Well, he expects the church is going to do a few things here, doesn't he? That you ought to be filled with goodness. That we ought to be good people. We need to be filled with knowledge. I mean, that's important. We've got to know what's right and wrong. And then we ought to be able to leverage that to admonish one another. It's kind of the title of the lesson. It's what Byron gave me for the lesson, this verse, admonishing one another. And so look, I was talking to Anne about this on the way here. I don't think you've got to be a Greek scholar to be able to understand everything in the Bible. But I want to make sure we know the word that's being used here. If you've got a different translation, it may say something different. Um, that's because there's a general concept behind this word, admonish. Yours may say instruct or teach. But the idea behind it, if you look at the definition, I think best characterizing this is like that sign I got up here. The idea behind admonishment is not just telling, it's not just informing, but there's an element of caution that's associated with what's being discussed. And that's the idea I want you to get when we talk about admonishing people. You're warning them. That's what we're doing. We're just warning them. A lot of kids here tonight, parents, you ever take time warning your kids about anything? Giving them a little bit of caution? Yeah, don't do that. You're going to die. I say that all the time. And I, I'm, do they not like that? I don't know. Sometimes I don't like that. I think in general, people don't like cautioned. You know, when you see that yellow sign on the road, what do you think? I don't know. It's pretty suggestive. I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, the white ones are the ones that are real. We don't like being cautioned. We were driving here, and you know, I was trying to navigate unfamiliar roads. Jim sent me nearly to my death uh, from his house down some really windy, wet roads. And trying to navigate that, get the windshield wipers going. I happen to have my bright lights on. And so a car kindly let me know I had them on by slamming on their horn for a quarter of a mile. So I could hear them behind me. And the kids and I, we got in a discussion about that. Like, that sounds rude. And we were talking about how there's probably never a kind time to use your horn. You know, when you're on the horn, you're letting somebody know, hey, you're stopped in the road, or there's something happening, or, you know, watch out. or something. Nobody ever hears a horn and they think, that was just the kindest thing anybody's ever done. So why do we have a horn? It's necessary. For the few times, on occasion, that someone needs to know something is a concern. So I want you to think about this as a Christian. Look, many of us as Christians can easily be on our horn all the time, can't we? You walk through the door and you got your horn on. All interactions of us are constant admonition. Look, look we'll talk more about this, but let's make sure we're not just um, overdoing the caution stuff. And I want to just share this with you too. One thing we learned from that verse before we really kick start the lesson. We were in the UK last year as a family. And, you know, they do a lot of things different than America. We visited with some Christians over there and a couple churches. And this is one of the things you saw all the time on the subway. My little kids love saying it. Um, they would always come on and say, see it, say it, sort it. And it, it was the idea that if you see some suspicious activity... It's up to you to kind of address it and deal with it. You know, there's not enough policemen to handle issues or problems, but there's a lot of yous. And so the, the idea behind this, and we do the, the same thing in America. We, we say something like, see something, say something. Like if you see something suspicious, then the onus is on you to deal with it. L listen, what I want to encourage you to do tonight is acknowledge this one fact. God has empowered you to handle problems in His church. 
Now, sometimes we sit back, it's easy to sit back and say, oh, I can't believe it. I hate that those kids up there are up there on their phones and they're not paying attention. I'm gonna, I hope the preacher deals with it, you know, or I hope the elders get a handle on things. Brother, one of the greatest ideas in the concept of a local church is that you have as much power to influence the lives of other people as I do. Like, you're called to that. To strengthen and to love. Look, it doesn't funnel in from the pulpit down. It is on the pews in the lives of the individuals. And so you got to feel responsibility as we're going through this lesson like, oh, this is me? Yeah, it's, it's you. It's me. That we're responsible for identifying people that need some admonishment, some caution, some warning, and it's up to me to say something about it. You agree? Is that okay? That's a hard thing, but we we got to be involved. If it's not happening with you, it may not happen. All right, we got five slides, five things to talk about. I, I alluded to this, but point number one, as Christians, we've got to have well-rounded relationships. Well-rounded relationships. What do I mean by that? I, I got First Thessalonians five fourteen up here, and I think a lot of Bible verses are like this. I want you to think about this verse with me for a minute. He's talking to the church at Thessalonica. And he says here near the end of his letter, Now we exhort you, brethren, to warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with them all. We exhort you, brethren, and I want you to appreciate this. There's really three different things that are going on here, and there are three different types of things that he wants you involved with. He said, yeah, this is our, our, our catchphrase, right? It's our verse, the idea of admonishing or warning those who are unruly. But we also need to be able to comfort the faint-hearted and uphold the weak and be patient with everybody. Now listen, what, what I want you to get from this is, is point number one. In Christianity, you're going to find people that are in all sorts of different phases of their life. And sometimes I'm really only good at one thing. I mean, that's, that, that's ultimately what I, I want to convey to you here in this slide. We're stronger in one of these areas. You know, if you read this verse and it's like, hey, comfort the faint-hearted, some of y'all may be awesome at that. I mean, you may be great. You may be the most perfect comforter. And, you know, if somebody's got a problem, you go over there and got your arm around them and you always lift them up and encourage them. Look, that's great. People that are faint-hearted need comforted. The weak need strengthened. Man, somebody can't get around, they can't do something, and you're their right arm. You're there to provide for them, to make clothes for them, to get food for them. Like, you're doing whatever's needed. Like, you're good at that. But guess what? Christianity is more than that. Some people are unruly. And they need somebody to warn them. Somebody's unruly. Listen, how good are you? Here's my question for you as we think about this slide. How would someone describe you? What are you? Are you somebody that excels in one of these areas? Here's my challenge to you. We've got to be good at all of them. We've got to be good at all of them. I can't just be the enforcer all the time and ignore encouragement and uplifting people. But listen, we can't also be a church that ignores problems and we just make everybody feel good. Like that, That's not the walk of a Christian. Think about it, and I'll say this multiple times tonight. Think about it in terms of parenting. Like if a parent is only a child's best friend, how good of a parent are you? Well, not good. I mean, they may have a good time, but they're probably going to be a brat. And what kind of parent are you if all you are is an admonisher, where every time your kid comes home, you're getting on to him, and you're like, hey, there's another problem, there's another problem, there's another problem. What God wants us to do is acknowledge sometimes people are going to need different things. And my actions are supposed to bend to whatever it is they need. All right, and so I'm not somebody constantly looking for problems, but I'll address them if they come up. And if I see somebody hurting, man, I'm going to heal them. If I see somebody weak, I'm going to help them. 
Like, I want to be that kind of person. And so what I want to encourage you to do here is we need to be the kind of person that can do this. Look, i got another verse up here. We won't take the time to read it. But 1 Samuel 2, you remember the story of Eli and his two sons? And do you remember what God said to him about his two sons? He had a problem. His sons were evil. Like, they didn't know God. And the Scriptures would go on to hold Eli accountable, and God Himself would say in verse 29, Look, you honor your sons above me. I don't ever want God to think of you as someone that doesn't love Him enough that you won't say what needs to be said to someone that needs corrected. That you so value these relationships that you lose sight of these relationships. I mean, let me pause here to say this. Why do we need to admonish anybody anyway? What's the idea of a warning in the first place? If nothing matters, there's no need to warn anybody. These are fake warnings. But if there are things in our walk with God that deserve caution, because they matter, like the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 10, like, hey, let's learn from Israel so that we don't sin like they sin. We don't tempt God. We don't commit immorality. Like, he that thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. I'm not trying to scare you, but sometimes there needs to be some warnings. I mean, go read any book in the New Testament and see where Paul's not concerned about anything. Everything's good. No, he's like, man, I can't leave you guys for five minutes without somebody coming in here and preaching something crazy, and you guys are believing it. Like, there's elements of truth that need to be held on to. And I've got to have the kind of character that is able to correct error when it appears. So that's my point number one. Like, we're going to have to develop this muscle if we don't have it. We need well-rounded relationships and to be able to jump into these categories when they're needed. Point number two, admonition, teaching, instruction, warning, is work. It's work. 2 Thessalonians 3, same idea. Paul says, if anybody doesn't obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with them, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, uh, but warn him as a brother. Admonition is work. What do I mean by that? Well, when you think about teaching, is teaching easy? Is talking to somebody about something easy? I don't know. Let me tell you what's easy. The easiest thing you can do in life is ignore everything. Isn't it? All right, that's kind of the, that's the base attitude of humanity. We'll stand by and watch a train wreck. I'm always shocked when I see videos people send me of like a fight or something, and there's like four people holding their phones. You know, they're like, this would be great. I'll just film this person getting the snot beat out of them. Like, we don't want to help. We like to watch. We like to talk about. We like to ignore. We don't like to get involved. We don't like to get engaged. I'm reminded of Genesis 4. When Cain kills Abel, God comes up there and asks him, Hey, where's your brother? And his favorite response that we all know is, Am I my brother's keeper? And of course, the challenge is, Yeah, you're your brother's keeper. You ought to know where your brother is. That's not an unusual thing to ask. But for many of us, our relationships at church are like Cain and Abel. I got you at arm's length, and if we spend a lot of time together, I may kill you. You know, I mean, that's, that's how it is for a lot of us. And so for many of us, instead of engaging in the work of admonition, it's easy just to sit on the sidelines and let things go. This is especially true. All right, when somebody's a problem. Because isn't that what we're talking about? We just are talking about somebody that's unruly. If I asked you to come in and I was like, all right, you need to spend a couple minutes kind of teaching some of the kids, and like, that, that's fun work. But when you got a Christian man that's not being the kind of husband he needs to be to his wife, and you know that's going on, do you think that's going to be a fun time to sit down and say, hey, can we talk about your relationship for a minute? I can tell you from experience. That's not a good time. You don't leave there thinking, okay, this was great. 
You leave there feeling drained emotionally, burdened, worse than you did before. Admonition is work. That's why, look, I can sell you on a potluck. Oh, let's get together and have a good time. I can sell you on bearing one another's burdens, you know, helping in a positive way. But it's hard to get people to sign up for this. Look, it's easy. Notice what he said in 2 Thessalonians 3. If there's somebody, and you remember the context, who's so lazy that they're not working, they're busy bodies, they're not doing what they're supposed to do in life, this is what you're to do. All right, it's a serious problem, and so I don't want you to have anything to do with those Christians. And that's going to cause some conflict. But notice he stops himself here and says, but... I don't want you to regard him as an enemy, uh, somebody to be discarded and left behind, even though Christians aren't supposed to do that. He says, but continue to warn him as a brother. Look, I don't know how many of you have been through the situations Anna and I have been through where a lot of times you have problems with your family. You know, everything's good, but then people grow up and they make really bad decisions. Right? People start leaving their spouses having divorces for crazy things. They start running around doing stuff. Let me tell you how fun that is in the holidays. Not a good time. And when somebody leaves Jesus or they leave the path, let me tell you the easiest thing to do. Yeah, they're a heathen. Can't believe how dumb they are. What decisions they've made. Yeah, let them, let them go and do nothing. Let me tell you the hardest thing to do. Pick up the phone and call and say, look, can we talk just about what's going on? Brethren, it's, it's work to admonish. And here's the, the saddest truth. That's why I'm like, they're going to hate me. I'm not going to come back next year. But look, the outcome of admonishment's not always positive either. All right, I would love to say, as soon as you build up the courage to go talk to Stephen about his problem, uh, things are going to go good and the church is going to be great for it. There's passages like Acts 7 that just tell me and remind me it's just not the case. You know, the easiest thing Stephen could have done is to not say anything at all, and he'd still be alive. But he didn't. The Jews were problems. And you know what he did? He taught a quick lesson about, hey guys, your track record's not real good at figuring out who's the good guys. You always killed the bad guys. You were a problem to Moses and everybody in, since the beginning. Pretty much everybody God has brought to you, you've killed, and you continue to do that with Jesus. Which of your fathers did you not persecute? And of course, what happened with his grand admonition? Yeah, he got killed. He got killed. And so what am I to take away from this? What am I to take away from this? I'll ask you this question. What's the risk of us not doing the work of admonition? Do you think Stephen made an influence, even though it cost him something? He did, didn't he? He left us a legacy of, hey, I think that guy was right. Hey, he shouldn't have been killed. This is crazy. No, this Stephen, man, he was... We still read his words today. Listen, if things go badly for you, what's the risk of not getting involved at all? Unaddressed problems, unruly people, church issues. Listen, let me tell you why this is hard. I could preach about this for a long time. The church is full of good people. All right, you've been spending years refining your character to be kind and one or two people that come into a church and they're rough and coarse and brash and arrogant. And you know what they need? The hammer. And you know who has a hard time pulling out the hammer? Nice, sweet Mildred that's trying to be the kindest person she could be her entire life. Not a lot of people want to sign up for the dirty work of admonishment because it's not in a real way who I am. But that's why we need to recognize, at times, this is who I have to be. This doesn't make you a bad person. This didn't make Stephen a mean person. It didn't make Paul evil or Jesus evil. Go read 
you know, Matthew 23, Jesus brought the hammer when the hammer was needed because people need warned and God equips you to do it, even though it's a lot of work. All right, point number three. No one, I don't think anybody's left yet, but we'll, we'll see. There's still time. Point number three. Admonition ultimately is love. Admonition is love. i got a verse for your consideration up here, Ephesians 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath or anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Same word, same idea. Admonition. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That same concept. Nurture and admonition. Well, what's a father supposed to do to their children? They're supposed to love their children. And I'll tell you, the, the greatest work you could imagine here is having children and, and, and being able to parent them and raise up the next generation that might take the reins of things after you're gone. And let me tell you, as parents, it's work. I mean, I look over here and I'm like, look, there's nothing but work happening over there. It's nonstop work. And... My kids are just a little older now to where it's not as much, but I remember that chaos. I'd be preaching, I'd see Anna with twins and another one going to the back, and I'm just like, see, have fun in the cry room. Man, it's work, and you spend so many years like, hey, you shouldn't do that, you can't do that, no, don't do that. All we want to do is encourage them and, and you know, hug them and whatever, but, but no, like, I care about you, and so you can't do these things. And as parents, we appreciate that warning and that kind of instruction really is because we love them. It is a sign of love. If you got your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 20, and we'll just read a few verses here. Um, a, a little bit of a lengthy reading, but I want you to appreciate Paul's attitude to the church at Ephesus as he was about to leave that. He sent and called for the elders of the church, and when they had come to them, he said to them in verse 17 or 18, You yourselves know... From the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now... Behold, bound by the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that chains and afflictions await me. But I do not make my life of any account, nor dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God, And now behold, I know that you all, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. Therefore I testify to you this day, I'm innocent of the blood of all. I didn't shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which you purchased with His own blood. I know that after my departure... Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, here's the key verse, be watchful, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. I mean, I hope we would all have the kind of relationship with our church family that Paul had. That if we knew we were never going to see each other again, there might be some tears shed. And what do tears represent? Emotion. Affection. Love. And Paul had it. And what did he say? He said, listen... For three years, every day, I warned you guys. 
My tears proved my affection for you. But I warned you that when I leave, you're going to be on guard because people are going to come in, even some among yourselves, and they're not going to spare the flock of God. Brethren, what does that tell you? What do I need to be doing? I need to be like Paul. Man, I, I, need, to, I need to consistently warn people about potential dangers, threats, like a dad, like a parent. Like, what's the greatest thing I can do for a new Christian? Hey, stay on the right course. Man, you're headed off in the wrong direction. And if I fail to do that, it's the greatest harm you can do to somebody. What do we think about parents who leave their kids alone? You see it on the news. You let them wander in the yard, wander into the street. Parents are inside on drugs, doing stuff, whatever. Derelicts. How do you think God looks at the church when we let our Christians and our young family wander off into the world? No instruction, guidance, or correction. It's the same thing. And so I just ask you this. I mean, do you love the people at this church? I mean, that's a question only you can answer. But if you love them, then as a parent corrects their child, man, get engaged and help keep someone on the path. That's what I want you to do. That's what Paul would do. And do it because you love people. If, if you're struggling here, then you got to ask yourself this question. If I'm not correcting people, what does that say about me? Remember what the Scripture said about God? Whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. All right, I mean, if God does it, then surely i got to do the same. All right, but point number four, before I get you too excited about going out and correcting people, I'm going to leave as fast as I can after church. So you're all like, I'm going to start with you. Um, let's, let, let's, let's talk about the spirit in which we conduct our admonition. Galatians 6.1 gives us some helpful tips here. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him. All right, we got that part. But notice this last part. In a spirit of gentleness, keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Man, we could, we could use this. Um, when we're going to correct someone, there's a Christian way to do it. All right, and I don't think we've always done a good job at that. Sometimes our admonition comes in anger. And I don't think that's, that's not the Bible way to do something. You ever been angry and just unloaded on somebody? And, and you think, hey, maybe they needed it. And maybe they did need it. But maybe the way you handled it uh, was totally wrong. We've got to be able to admonish people in a way that mirrors the Spirit of God. Let me remind you of what Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 in verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may give them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by Him to do His will. I think it's helpful for Timothy. When we're in the right and somebody's in the wrong, what do you feel like that gives you license to do? Pretty much whatever you want. You know, I, I, can, I can tell you, you're wrong. You did something wrong. I saw you. You're, you know, and, and you feel almost justified and vindicated in how you treat someone because you're ha having a moral high ground. Let me caution you here. The spirit in which we conduct ourselves as Christians is always infused with gentleness, kindness. If that's not a hallmark of our interaction, then we're not living like a Christian. The reality is, if we do this wrong, our admonition could actually make things worse. You ever experienced that? Where your punishment went a little too far? Where you said too much? Where you feel like, hey, ugh, probably conduct myself in the right way? What does the Scripture say? Speak the truth in love. 
so that we can build each other up into the Spirit of Christ. So, do you have that? Can you use discretion with your anger? Can you have wisdom in how you deal with someone so that you don't lose your cool? So that you stay patient? You're not quarrelsome? You're gentle? To be. Look, you got to deal with the opposition, but Christians do it in the right way. This is a question for you here. How well do you think you perform correction? Like, is, is this slide for you? Are you thinking about this here and you're like, well, yeah, I could probably do a better job of that. I, I know it's easy for me to lose my cool. Kids do something wrong. I know they've done something wrong. You know, time for the pain. But man, we want to teach and instruct because what's the purpose? Our purpose is not punitive, but corrective. Think about that as Christians. I'm not trying to kill you. I'm trying to help you. That's why we're having this conversation. I'm not getting on to you to try to just grind you into the dust and make you feel horrible. I want you to change because I want things better. And if you have that kind of spirit, I've seen it. People are way more apt to change than somebody that doesn't have the Spirit of Christ. All right, point number five, and let, let's talk about this for just a few minutes, and then we'll wrap it up. Let's talk about our receiving admonition for a minute. Our receiving admonition. This is hard. Like, like if I've encouraged you to maybe be more active and engaged in your local church, to kind of address an issue if you see it. Wonderful. Do that. But let me just go ahead and tell you, every once in a while, for this to play out at a local church, I'm going to be on the receiving end of admonition. And let me tell you, it's hard to do. I've been on the receiving end of a lot of admonition as a preacher. I remember Joe <laughs> preaching. I'd say something in the pulpit, and I could already tell he didn't like it. And I'd be barely getting down after the invitation song. I'd see him in the back. Come here. I'm going to talk to you. But it's hard as a preacher. But, but you put your foot in your mouth a lot of times. You're, you're wrong. I've been wrong. I've said wrong things. And so what are you going to do when you receive correction? i, I got Acts 8 up here. You remember the story of Simon the sorcerer? You know, he was a problem. He was a charlatan. He was arrogant. He was prideful. But he was convinced about the veracity of Jesus, the real power of the Holy Spirit worked through the apostles. And after it says he believed, becoming a Christian, the very first thing he said was, hey guys, I see y'all are passing this stuff around. Um, why don't y'all give some to me? That's how the world works. I got some money here. Can I be able to do the things you're doing? Now, Peter's response here is, Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And I didn't really include the best part, which was just prior to this, where he said, Your money perish with you. Now, we take for granted that the Bible has some Pretty classic, strongly worded statements. But I'm going to throw this out here for you as we think about it. How would you have responded to Peter's admonition? I mean, think about it. You're, you're a new Christian. You're coming up talking to one of the big guys. You're like, hey, what do you think? I mean, can I get in on this? And he's basically like, you're going to hell. Did you not hear all the things I've been talking about? You better hope that if it's even possible, God may forgive that wicked intent of your heart. You can take your money and die. Could you imagine saying that to a Christian? Number one, that, that's up for us, right? We need to get better about admonishing people. This is how serious sin is. This is how serious problems are. We need to be stronger, most likely. But if I'm encouraging you to be stronger, how are you going to be when someone takes it? When someone listens and they give it to you, what are you going to say back? Do you remember what he said back here? You remember what his comment was? No, you guys pray for me. 
pray that all, none of this stuff happens to me. Like he received it well. Like he didn't throw anything back. He was like, oh, man, you, you, guys, you guys pray for me. I don't want any of this stuff, bad stuff to happen to me. Listen, how well are we at receiving admonition? The devil wants us to think people that correct us are our enemies. We won't take the time to turn there, but you know what Galatians 4 says. Have I become your enemy since I tell you the truth? And that's how people view it. If you come to church and someone corrects you, that's a bad thing. You're the bad guy. I'm not, I'm not your enemy. Like, we've already established that admonition and teaching and instruction and warning and correction, all that stems from a place of love. If I didn't care about you, I wouldn't spend a minute of my time talking to you. I'm only here because I want to engage with you. But the devil wants to put in our minds that these are the bad guys. This person hates me. This person... That they don't hate you at all. Well, maybe they do, but maybe we need to hear it. Listen, is it any surprise that at the end of Revelation 3, really in every letter to the seven churches, Jesus basically says, hey, if you got an ear, you better hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he said that multiple times, but he said it there to every church. Why does he say that? Because we need to listen. So listen, if you're a young person and your parents have something to say to you, sorry, I'm pointing at my own kids. Like, you listen to me. Um, you got an ear, you better listen. This is what God says to us. Be grateful you have ears. Here's three points in one. When I am hearing correction and admonition, do this. Have the humility to accept it. The courage to correct it and gratitude that somebody actually gave you some direction. Man, that's what we need. We need people that are ready and willing to respond. I don't need people like this girl that left the church that said, I don't want to be judged. Well, I don't want to judge you. I'm not trying to do anything. Like, I just want to talk about what matters to God and what God said matters. Like, I'm not trying to provide some kind of judgment. And so here's my question for you. Are you ready to receive correction? Are you the kind of person that people are like, I'm scared to death to talk to you about anything? If we are, it's to our own detriment. You remember what the Scripture says in the story of David and Abigail and Nabal? His name was Fool because he was, but you remember what it said about him? Nobody could say anything to him. That's the kind of man he was. And in America, we view that as a badge of honor or macho. But brethren, it's foolish all day long. Be the kind of person that will listen to correction and instruction. Look, and, and I'm not trying to do this. All right, I got two slides. I'm going to finish up. I know sometimes after lessons like this, we're like, all right, it's about to get real. I'm going to sit down and with a fine tooth comb, I'm going to think who in the congregation needs correcting. And you know what? This week, I'm just going to do it. Look, look I, I'm, not, I'm not wanting you to sit around and think about, I've been wanting to talk to her this whole year, and now I'm emboldened to do it. The, our, our first responsibility as Christians is always to look inward. All right, that's what Jesus said. Don't, don't go poking around at a speck in somebody else's eye when you've got a plank in your own. Well, one of the most awkward times a church can ever go through is trying to appoint elders when this is exactly what we do. And for the first time in six years or ten years, we're like, okay, I'll think about your character for a minute. Yeah, you're flawed in about ten ways. And out of nowhere, we come up with all sorts of problems I've had with a man, and this whole time I've never once said anything to you about it. But now you get a stack of papers and a list about how people feel about you. Brother, that's foolishness. Address things as they're needed. Address things in your own life. And know that with proper admonition... A well-rounded church is going to become better. I like this quote from John Wooden, an old basketball coach, probably one of the greatest coaches. He's got a million great quotes. He said, a good coach can change a game, but a great coach can change a life. Brethren, what you're doing with admonition is changing lives. That's what you're doing. I don't want you to get involved just because God asked you to do it. I want you to see on the other side of where simple instruction leads. It leads to good kids, good relationships, 
stronger Christians, people that are following Jesus, like, that, that's all you're doing. You're, you're changing lives. I hope you can do it. I appreciate your time and attention tonight. And I hope that, look, if that's you, go correct it. If it's something you need to do, let's get engaged. Next time you see something, be emboldened to say something about it. But if tonight the problem is you, and you need to make your life right with God, man, let's do it. Maybe you need baptism. Maybe you need your confession. Maybe you don't even know what you need. But you've been convicted in some way by the Scriptures to know God's over here and you're over here and you want to get connected. Thankfully, through Jesus, you can do that. Through His blood and sacrifice, man, the price has been paid. All He wants to know is if you believe in Him, trust in Him, and are ready to follow Him. And if you're ready to make that confession, man, we'd love to help you through your confession, repentance, baptism, whatever it is. Come forward as we stand and sing together.